If you're like most people out there, and I include myself, at some point you've thought of Montessori school as being just for little children. Now, as I've learned over the years, though, that is far from true. And if you are a parent today, I would say that that kind of little kid's perspective on Montessori is not a great perspective to have because you might be missing out on something really amazing for your child and also for yourself. So to help shed some light on what actually happens in Montessori classrooms after preschool and kindergarten, I'll be talking with a woman who is filled with insights about Montessori elementary. Debbie Thompson has seriously seen it all, as she has been in Montessori for literally 50 years. She was trained in Italy so long ago that her examiner was Maria Montessori's own son, Mario. Like You do not get much more OG than that. In addition to just the number of years she's been in Montessori, Debbie has both the Montessori primary and elementary training. So that means she's worked with three-year-olds all the way up to 12-year-olds. And over her career, she taught at schools in Kentucky and Arizona, as well as started the first Montessori elementary program in Colorado. And along the way, she had two children of her own and was a consultant for over a decade with AMI, and that's the Association Montessori International. Debbie finished out her career as a teacher in the classroom, retiring in 2018. And when you hear Debbie's voice, I think you'll understand that she's got a lot of fight left in her. She has more passion and energy than I would say like most 20 year olds these days. So I am grateful to have discovered Debbie, and I'm also grateful she accepted my invitation to talk today. Now, whether you're a parent or teacher listening, uh, or even just some random person who's interested in Montessori, I hope you enjoy and gain from our discussion. So uh, let's get going. The educator Dr. Maria Montessori once said, The child developing harmoniously and the adult improving himself at his side make a very exciting and attractive picture. Welcome to Montessori Education with me, Jesse McCarthy, where we talk raising children and educating students while bettering ourselves right alongside them. All right, Debbie Thompson, thank you so much for being with us today. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Jesse. It's nice to be here reflect on my years of experience. (laughs) Yeah, and it's nice to be a guest hearing the reflection, let me tell you. So hopping right in, you know, one of the biggest things I hear from, quote, normal parents or in the traditional school is is about Montessori and kind of not being academic or not having to do with, the children aren't learning enough or something like that. And I know in Montessori, we think of the child development and learning more in an integrated whole approach, which is kind of this idea of cosmic education, but that can be a little bit weird to normal parents. So can you just, what is cosmic education? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think Montessori's approach to education in general, whether it's from the birth to six years of age, six to 12, 12 to 18, her feeling is that, you know, children are on this journey of um, becoming who they're going to be. And within each child, there is the potentialities that no one can feed into them. It's not like we have the certain curriculum that we want to make sure everyone gets the same thing. And so um, cosmic education is looking at those universal tendencies of children throughout their different uh, periods of development. But particularly, it ties into the elementary because the children are so intellectually motivated at the elementary level. And so her view was that, what do we give this child who's insatiable in learning? And she says, well, we give them, what's the biggest thing we can give them? We can give them the universe. (laughs) And so um, you can't prescribe something that gives the child every bit of information that you wanna give them. So you have to give them a framework. And there's a lot of interrelatedness with things that the children learn. But the idea is that they are learning not to be a child just of their time, but to be the beneficiary of gifts that have come before to become the adult they're going to be, but also that is the person who's going to um, chart the course for humanity. So Montessori's vision, I think for cosmic education was big and that what's happening with each individual unit is kind of a piece of a whole 
tapestry of knowledge, tapestry of our planet and where we're going. Um, and it was, you know, it was certainly what captured me um, when I first took the training in Italy from um, Camillo Grazzini, who was a pro progeny of Mario Montessori. And I just remember that that opened up like, what is this? This is different than I had in my other education classes. And it came back again later on in the year when Mario came to um, visit the training center, Mario Montessori. And we were complaining we'd gotten so much, so much academic work, which goes on with the child at the elementary level. But, you know, you're just saturated and you're wondering, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? And Mario comes back and says, I'm not teaching you to be a teacher. I want you to learn about the child, the child's development and who this child is and how that, per, how that child fits into the universe. So it's an overall concept of how we can pull out the best of each child and you know, prepare them for whatever task they may have. I, first of all, I was to say, it's it's so funny and fascinating and lovely to me that you're talking about, oh, Mario just stops by and he has a little conversation. <laughs> I just love it. I was so, so lucky, you know, because um, I've been through different, different periods of trainers and teachers and, and Mario was still carrying that flame and the trainers who came after that carried the flame and the yeah. trainers who are now doing the training. Yeah. They have not lost that essence of what Montessori is. And that's what's just so um, wonderful because yeah. the child is not changing. The child is the same child that was here since the beginning of humans, so. Yeah, and then, you know, just your talking about, you know, in the training, particularly in elementary, it's just this wealth of knowledge and of, of all these subjects that you as a elementary teacher have to learn. So I, I it's, it's this sense that there's so much out there, but as it seems like Mario said it with you, and then you seem to be bringing that, if you just focus on content and not who the child is or this kind of spiritual essence of this child developing, then you're missing out on everything, right? Is that kind of? Yes. I mean, the content it would be like, you know, if a teacher thinks that what the child is going to get is what you feed them yeah. and that's it. But in Montessori, you're, teaching the child to explore. You're giving a framework, you're giving um, a key so that they can open what is really interesting to them. So they're not gonna explore every single thing in um, detail, but they're gonna explore some things in great detail. Mm -hmm. And it's going to tie into a lot of different subjects areas. It doesn't mean that there's not a core curriculum that every child must be accountable for, but hopefully they're getting so, so much more. I mean, the I learned more in my Montessori training than I did in my college classes for botany and zoology and history. And um, just because of the path that um, repeats itself with the, some of the needs that, the, that children have today. So um, as an example, you know, even if you're, one of my passions is I love handwriting. <laughs> and so I would teach my children cursive, but then it comes with the history of language it comes with, oh my gosh, I wonder where this writing came from. And when did people first start writing? And you tie it into early civilizations. And then you start appreciating that and practicing it. And they love it. They absolutely love it. And they look at it as a gift and they perfect it. Um, yeah, just, and Debbie, you're saying that one thing that stood out to me is that the difference in normal school, it's like, here's just some stuff. There's an English language, now learn it. Or here's, you know, algebra, just learn it. Where yeah. I found in Montessori that what she does is almost make the child and the teacher go through that process of where did this come from? How did this develop? And it, did, do you see, I have to imagine you see that, but I, I'm curious, like what your thoughts are. Well, I think the other really, really important part of Montessori is that triad of the child, the teacher and the environment. And so the child is not just looking at the teacher as imparting information to them, mm. but that the child acts upon the environment, which is why the preparation of the environment and the materials is so um, important because the child will discover something and they will be so excited. You've given the lesson, you've shown them the material, you've asked them to do certain things and they work with their friends and, um, and all of a sudden they will spark 
look what I have found out as if they were the first person to ever discover yes. this. Yes. That power of discovery and motivation and making it their own. And you, of course, have tried to set the framework for that to happen, but you don't know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. I've seen children find associations that I never would have, that I hadn't thought of. So you're giving them that ability to make learning their own. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I think that's beautiful. And there is something that goes along with that, that you don't feel like you're dependent on anybody else. Like it's you in the world and learning. And then you have this helper alongside you, like Miss Thompson or Debbie, whatever you went by is my helper, but you don't feel like that's everything in the world is my teacher, you know? Oh no. And then the teacher has to be a master of maybe going by and just think, Hmm, I wonder, have you thought about this? Yeah. <laughs> or you entice the child, especially this elementary child. This elementary child is just dying to learn. They're dying to do big work. It's also such a critical time for them to work with others. And so it's the idea is that the summation of what we do together is greater than I could do on my own. Mm-hmm. And so you talk about socialization. Well, these children, especially at the elementary level, are learning to be... Um, to work with other people and what are the rules for working with other people. This particularly is what I've been thinking of this last couple of weeks is how we live and work together. How we appreciate what other people have to offer us and how we, you know, we have to set up code of ethics and rules in order for us to um, be able to feel secure and safe and being able to know that we can, you know, aspire to what we want to do. So yeah. um, Debbie, on that note, can you talk, because this is what comes up a lot, and then especially because parents say, well, you know, preschool's done, so I'm going to normal school or something like that. You know, Montessori, it's for little kids, and I've heard that. There's a fear, I think, among some parents that, well, how could my elementary child have freedom to learn when they would just play all day or, you know, they don't really want to do real work. They'd have, you know, you have to force children to do real work. Like how, what's the balance between that freedom and limits or structure? How do you do that in the elementary environment? Well, first of all, you've set up an environment. So you've really limited your environment. So what's in the environment is accessible to the children, given that you've given a lesson to them and they're ready to you know, move on to something. Um, and it's not just freedom to wander or freedom to do whatever you want to do. It's freedom with responsibility. So it is trusting the child that they're going to make choices and they're, they're going to, you know, um, find their way of doing something. They'll get some help from someone, but they have to be accountable. They can't just decide not to do something. They may decide to pursue perhaps this part on the timeline of life of um, working with the Paleozoic era, maybe, (laughs) rather than the Mesozoic era, but then it all comes around to other children doing work. But you have three things for that accountability. You have the child must keep track of their time. They have to record what they've worked on and they have to record what have they accomplished. And then they have a conference with the teacher. The teacher has to keep track of that child. And I mean, they have a conference with them, but some children it might be real short every day with some children once a week. And as they get older, I could go for two or three weeks and the child will keep track of their things, but they are becoming responsible. It's not that they're doing stuff because it's been assigned to them yeah, or because today you have to do this, this, and this, and then maybe you have time to choose on your own. And so they have to be accountable. And then, of course, the beauty of Montessori is you have children for three years. Mm -hmm. And so I could see them touching on, um, you know, some of the some of the math materials for multiplication or division or whatever. And then they each they reach a higher, higher level of that till they get to abstraction. And so you see them becoming more and more confident. You know, I would have a third grader, for example, a first year child coming in, of course, this is all new to them and they don't even have to tell time and they don't know how to write in their journal, but they learn and they, they kind of aspire to see what other children are doing. But I would have a, an older child come to a conference and they've already organized their work, what's finished, what's not finished, what they still need to do, what they need help with. I think I'm ready for this next lesson. (laughs) They start owning what, you know, being accountable for what they want to learn, what they need to learn. 
And it's really amazing they can do this. Um, and then the third, and then the third thing is so they have to keep track of their work. They have a conference and they're planning what they need to work on. And then they do have to be accountable. There's certain things, of course, society says we have to learn. And usually by the time you've done a lot of this really fantastic materials that we have, the children have learned a lot of things and without even having to say you have to learn this. So mm -hmm. um, there is accountability with the uh, freedom and discipline and responsibility. And so it may appear you come into a classroom that children are just kind of really, really engaged with their work and they're working with something for a very long time because if a child's really engaged with their work, they can work with something for a very, very long mm -hmm. time. So Debbie, now we see this and I mean, like your description of it, I, I find it amazing when I see a child, you know, working for two hours straight on, let's say a math problem. And I'm like, man, I never was that engaged in that way. So we've seen this and you've seen it, I mean, year after year, decade after decade, but the normal parent thinks, might think to herself, my child, there's no way they're going to be like, ah, I'm not doing any math today. I'm just going to do whatever I want. What would you do as a teacher when something like that comes up? Well, the expectation is to find something to engage them in. And so a lot of times it's, um, you know, there are times when you really need to entice a child and you need to lay out possibilities. I wonder if you're ready for this. I'm not sure. Um, and mo mainly it's the peer influence. It's like, oh my gosh, I think you might really be ready to show, you know, Angela, this problem, I, you've been working on it so long, do you think you might be ready to give this lesson? Mm. So part of it is how, how can you get them to, com to continue to focus on something that's of interest to them, but they still need to still work on it more. Yeah. And there's a lot of ways you can do that. And there's some, um, you know, the teacher has to really observe and see what's happening. You see if a child's bored, it's because they do need some new impetus to do something. If they're sitting there, they're just playing around and scribbling on things. And it's like, oh, looks like you might be ready to go into something else. And I had this lesson I was gonna show you. <laughs> so part of it is you observe and you see, and sometimes it's my fault. Oh my gosh, I have not given any lessons in geometry for the last two weeks. Yeah. Or I've been so into doing biology that you know I need to balance my lessons out. Yeah, a lot of times it's a note to the teacher and not just the child. So you're constantly, as I always think, I'm, I'm a conductor. You're constantly observing and seeing how to fine tune your orchestra and how to help each child and how to get them together. And so that's, that's the art of teaching. Yeah. Given Montessori as your vehicle to do that. So what you, what you said, there are two things. One is just... When you're speaking, Debbie, I can just see the teacher in you because I know this, you know, and I, I love it because I've just seen the, the contrast of like a regular traditional school teacher, or even some of these, pro, you know, super progressive schools. The children are either like, okay, kids, we're all doing this, or it's like, all right, just run around and do what you want. And what you're doing is you see a child, maybe not super engaged, you walk over and the way you say, oh, wow, I got something to show you. And it's just so, it's, I, I'm excited. And I know children pick up on that. So it's just one thing that jumped out. But the second thing is you mentioned that, you know, and this is kind of the mixed age, you know, realm of Montessori, but that they might see other children doing something or another child might help. And in elementary, it seems that you're doing, the child's much more involved in deliberately creating the community or being a part of its own development. So what, what is there that's that's different than in say primary the younger children three to six that comes about in the six to nine and then you know as you move up with the nine to twelve in terms of community and community building? Well, I mean, I think if you look at the, I mean, you've taken the primary training, you look at the child as building himself, the, the child from birth to six, or or from gestation to six, is learning how to develop his physical self and um, very much into himself. And I love to get children in the elementary that have had a good three or four years in Montessori because they have a sense of order. They're very meticulous. They put things away. They are very independent. But then you come into the elementary and here the child wants you to help him think for himself. And he does that with, in a social community because that's such a strong urge at the elementary level. And so, um, and so part of the approach at the elementary level is having the children do group work. 
group work doesn't mean you're doing the same work side by side. Yeah. That's probably the hardest concept for children <laughs> first coming into the from the primary because they want to have all of their own stuff and they want to work with someone, but they want to keep it. And, yeah. and it's a journey. But group work is so essential. I mean, the children love to show each other their work. They love to work each other, constantly aspiring, when can I do this? When they see this older child doing it. Mm -hmm. And so they are pulled through the curriculum by the older children in the classroom or by all the children. So it's not just a stimulation from the teacher. It's like they know, boy, I can't wait till I can get to do this. Mm -hmm. And the other, and I think probably one of the, the other aspects of that elementary child is they are ready to really develop a morality, a civility. This is what they want to do. How do we work together? How do we um, treat each other? Um, and so a lot of this sharing of work means, which is why you have a limited environment. If you had enough things for everyone to work on, they wouldn't have to wait their turn. Mm -hmm. So the limited environment means, I want to do this. Can you please get me when you're finished with this? Or why don't you come and join me? We can do this together. Mm -hmm. But the sense of morality, you look at the young child in the primary who will model what you say, the child in the elementary is going to model what you do and what you think and how you feel and what your mm -hmm. values are. And this is the period. <laughs> I keep thinking of how much happens in this period to look at how do we treat each other? And we have, you know, so we have, we develop rules in the classroom. How do we want our classroom to be? We have community meetings. Um, how can we solve this problem? They work together, you know, they play together. How do you take turns? So, boy, is this a crucial time for the uh, development of, um, you know, that morality or that sense of justice. That's where you get a lot of tattling. So-and-so did this and so-and-so did this because they're trying to find out, oh, is this right? I don't think this is right. Yeah. So and what a critical period for that. So you are working with all of these tendencies of development and using those to enhance all the academic work the kids are learning. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, the kind of maybe a group meeting to there's a problem that arises and you guys discuss it. And I just think to myself, if we had that type of going on for the years in elementary, larger in society, we wouldn't be thrown out there with little ability to kind of communicate with one another. Or if a real conflict arises, which happens in the real world all the time, we mm -hmm. go, oh, here's a conflict. Let's sit down and talk about how we're going to solve it. Right. You know? So I just... No, it's just, I I mean, when you, when we hopped on the first thing, you know, we talked about, because obviously it's right around the time, you know, just a lot of stuff is going on in America in particular. It's like, what would it be like if we were able to communicate better with one another and to, to solve our own problems, as opposed to looking to somebody else to solve our problems for us? You know? Oh, and you look at how Montessori has put that in the environment of the primary child, the elementary child, the adolescent environment. Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of cringe sometimes when I hear some adults talking about, oh, that person's acting like a child. And I keep uh, thinking, I wish these people would act like a child. <laughs> <laughs> but it's within that child where they have compassion and they have feelings and they don't want to have people hurt. So it's like, this yeah. is, you know, it's within each child. And this was Montessori's approach is that there is such you know, such potentialities in all aspects of our life to develop and grow. And, um, and children are adaptable. They are going mm -hmm. to adapt whatever kind of environment they're in. Yeah. So it's, it's wonderful to have an environment and to have an approach that will help this child to create the person they're going to be in a healthy way and um, see yeah. how that develops throughout their life. And I wonder how much we just have a sense of what a quote child is based on, you know, some of the, maybe the destructiveness of what we see around us in quote normal children, if they, they're not engaged in something, because, you know, when you say, uh, my wife and I have talked about this, because when you said, you know, oh, you're acting like a child. And I, I had to actively get rid of that language in my vocabulary, because it's just, it comes almost so naturally, like, don't, don't act like a child, you know, and, <laughs> and, um, we just uh, recently, this is not about politics at all, but I heard, you know, Trump say something, only a child would say that, or only a child would think that, like, at, you know, to kind of say my opponents aren't that, you know, whatever. And 
again, this is not about politics. It's just something that people say. And I thought to myself, are you so sure about that? That, you know, the child is so ignorant that the child is so stupid or the child just doesn't listen. So it makes, it makes me think, Debbie, when you say that, and I've thought about it myself, is that we have a wrong view of children, period. You know, yeah, what they're capable of. Lori said the hope for our future is in the child, yeah. is in the child being able to, not just to absorb what we want them to absorb, but to burst out. Yeah. To be able to fulfill something that we have no idea how it's going to impact our world and our mm -hmm. universe. And I just, you know, I look at different students that I've had and I could just see in them characteristics and how that was molded and developed and nurtured and where they may be now. And, um, you know, it's, it's amazing to be able to see that. And, to, and I would love, I love the strong-willed child. Sometimes the shy child, I have to bring out and have them be more crazy. And the strong-willed child, I know they have so much potential. I just got to find something that they're going to put all of their energy into. Yes. So, you know, there's all, you know, each child, oh my gosh, they're all each so unique. Yeah. So maybe, you know, hitting on, that we see the beauty in children, we see the potential in children and in Montessori environments that obviously you've worked in and I've seen and worked with, it's so possible to just, the potential is there and they're able to work towards it or even achieve it. But sometimes we as teachers, even in Montessori and then definitely in the normal world, we can become obstacles to their success or to their growth. So, and I know you raised this months ago when we first connected, you just talked about, we need to get you know, these obstacles, we need to deal with them, we need to get around them. So what are some of the obstacles you've seen? And you know, how do we get around them as adults? Well, and, you know, I would encounter obstacles that I created all the time. <laughs> I may have given a lesson that I, I was so excited about, and I wanted to work so much on it. And I would take the children, we would do go into depth with it. And then when I finished, they would not touch the lesson. It's mm -hmm. because I gave them too much. I didn't just entice them and get them started and send them on their way. So that's one obstacle is not trusting the child to follow up on something and you're just enticing them enough to go work on it. You know, another obstacle is, oh yes, we want the children to be able to be free, to be to choose their own work, but I just don't quite trust that they're gonna get everything done that I want them to do. So I'm gonna put on the board each day, three assignments that during the day they need to get done. Mm. And then whatever they ever, whatever else they do, you know, they can choose. That sets an obstacle because the children are not going, they're going to say, I have to do this, this, and this. And they did not get started with what they passionately wanted to pursue that day. Mm. So you're setting up assignments and not trusting that the child has it within himself or herself to be able to um, manage that on their own yeah. with your help and support. Um, another obstacle I see a lot and like, and you really have to be careful is the uninterrupted work time where you want to have that three hour morning work time and a two or three hour afternoon work time. And when you start imposing, um, a lot of other, okay, there's a librarian. He wants to give groups every Tuesday afternoon. There's a PE teacher who wants to give a group on Thursday afternoon. As soon as you start having that, the child comes into the classroom and says, hmm, what are we doing this afternoon? What, what do I need to do this afternoon? Uh, so um, within the framework of the least of AMI as a consultant, you know, you can have one work period where you might have, especially at the elementary level, where you might have some of those specialists, whether it's a PE teacher or a foreign language teacher or whatever, but you have to be so careful because it's, it's amazing because this just happened in my school that I had here in Kentucky where they were just putting in one other afternoon. Well, we couldn't fit this in, so we're gonna do this. As soon as that happens, you see the child just kind of laying back, okay, what are you gonna do for me today? Hmm. That's an obstacle. Passive. Yeah, that passive demeanor of a child, right? Yes. Waiting. Yes. Um, too many adults. You know, I think in a lot of traditional situations, they think the fewer number of kids in a class, the more that that adult teacher can interact with each and every child. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Montessori, we want large classes, you know, primary classes of 28 to 30 or elementary classes of, you know, minimum is supposed to be like 24 to 35. Mm -hmm. And only one teacher 
Yeah. The assistant's role is not to teach. The assistant's role is to be an aid to the teacher. And so if the child feels like, oh, I can go to this adult or this adult, they're not using each other. They're not struggling. They need to have the struggle. Yes. And <laughs> you know, they can't have that immediate uh, answer. And, De and Debbie, it's so, the thing is in the, in the quote, normal world, it's so counterintuitive. Because you just know, like the the see the seeming ideal would be if my child could have one on one with a teacher, and yes. you know, and I know through experience I've seen that that is not the ideal. That I mean, that's the way to make the child super dependent at this age. You know, I mean, obviously, if I had Michael Jordan and I was already planning to be an NBA star, I'd love to just be one on one with Michael Jordan. But yes. <laughs> but we're talking about young children, not you know your your expert that they're going to model after. So. Uh, you've seen this, but how can you give a, maybe even a more vivid picture to a parent who's in their mind, they've got this idea, oh, my child's sitting next to X, learning from him or her as the teacher. That sounds so much better than being around 10 other children or 15 or 20 other children and just one teacher. Like, how can you make that real to a normal parent? Well, I think, you know, educating the parent, of course, is also sharing a lot of these principles with them, you know, independence in the home, responsibilities in the home. But, you know, I think, um, and I always love to have parents come because usually we'll do some sort of work where the children can show the parents their work. You mm -hmm. do want to pay the parents to see what is it like when they come to observe or they come visit or whatever. And when they see what the children are, you know, capable of doing. Mm -hmm. um, I think when they see that, as long as the parent is seeing progress, and this is where your parent teacher comes in, as long as I see a child really using their time and I see that they're making progress, they may be stuck in an area. And you will talk to the parent, this child's really stuck. Let's see, this is what I'm doing. And maybe you could do this at home. There might be an occasion where you might need to get some extra help for a child. If they're you know, stuck in a way that, you know they just need a lot more practice in something. But you know, you're going to really use the environment. It doesn't mean that that child needs to be flooded with extra people, you know, telling them what to do. You just try to give them the right lesson and have them proceed. Um, yeah, that is a big thing for parents see a big classroom and maybe one teacher, but that's for some of the best work. In fact, there was one consultation I did and this teacher was doing a six to 12 class and she had, what was it? 35 or 40 children um, that day and her assistant was gone. Wow. <laughs> and I said, oh my gosh, you know, how, how are things going to go? And she said, oh, they'll be just fine. They know what to do and they can help each other. <laughs> and they did. It yeah. was amazing because they were so disciplined. They were so respectful of the environment and what they needed to do to help and their responsibilities. It was gorgeous. You know, so it's, um, yeah, and that's, I mean, isn't that at the end of the day, that's the ideal too, is that, I mean, if they're, if they're capable of doing that at, you know, nine, 10, 11 years old, what is it going to be like at 20? You know, they're, they're free and they don't need somebody to be, you know, looking over their shoulder at every moment. Are you working right now? You know, are you, are you doing the right thing? Are you being moral? You know, like, so Oh, and the children have such compassion for children who are struggling. Yeah. They know the children that just really need help with focus or concentration. And they're so generous with helping with that. Um, I mean, they can just perceive who needs help and you know how, to, how they encourage each other. So it's... Uh, and Debbie, that point that you just said, I've seen that throughout Montessori. And that's one of my favorite things because it's this, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a spontaneous care for your fellow peer, your fellow man in a sense, or woman in a sense. Uh, and what it seems like Montessori is saying is that when a child is content in his own work or her own work, then she's ready to say, let me look around. But if they didn't get that contentment and they're getting like kind of lectures on how you're supposed to help your peers and so forth, they find they seem to feel it like it's an imposition on them. Mm -hmm. Have you found that throughout your experience teaching and so forth? Or what, what's your take on that? Well, I really feel like the child has to feel confident in themselves, which is why that beauty of the, 
primary classroom is so beautiful because the children come in pretty confident with work habits. That's where work habits are established. And then when they come into the elementary, here they can use those work habits and they can just, they are so excited about the curriculum and learning and knowledge. I mean, these children are insatiable when you give them, um, you know, the work. So, um, you know, I think it's, you know, I think they're working together. It builds upon itself until they get to the adolescent where things fall to pieces again, and then they really have to do <laughs> work together and they have to challenge that they could really create their own little society. <laughs> and then you always are gonna have children who have come from other outside, um, who may not have had Montessori in the primary, who may be coming at age seven or eight. And it, you know, it just depends. It takes, it takes a while. Um, and you may, and they may have missed some of those fine sensorial things, fine tuned sensorial things that happen in the primary class. And I always tell a parent, I said, this is not going to be something that may work in a month where your child is, yeah. you know, adjusted. It may take a year, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it takes time. Yeah. And, in, you know, in the, with Montessori, the one, one of the things I've loved to see is that there's no floor or ceiling in the classroom. Like you're, you're never doing too little or too, you know, you're not too quote stupid or too genius. It's just, you're who you are. And I think some, like you just mentioned, if somebody comes in quote from the outside, I've seen this in, in schools that I've worked in before Montessori is that they're always quote catching up. There's always a feeling like, you know, I need to get up to their level. And what I found in Montessori classrooms is there, there might be a desire to reach where some of the other children are, but they're accepted where they're at for who they are when they come in the classroom. It's not like, oh my gosh, you're so beneath us. So have you seen that or what's your take on that? Well, the children are, you know, pretty much, um, you know, I can direct another child. Could you please help this child with this? Mm -hmm. um, and it depends on the child and where they are and what their situation is and what their experiences have been. They may, they may be so excited. Usually I find that they overreact to thinking that they don't have a real specific work that they have to do for this 30 minutes and this 30 minutes and this 30 minutes. Yes. So generally they feel you know that they can do what they want, which is not what the Montessori children have learned to do. They know that they need to do more than what I would want them to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you're constantly, I mean, you're constantly expecting more from the child from where they are and guiding them to dig deeper, to expand their work, to, mm -hmm. you know, maybe, you know, reinforce what they're doing by showing others or by, you know, um, helping someone else with their work. Um, yeah. So you, it sounds like you almost, you basically said it better than I did because you're, you're saying they're in a way they're accepted for who they are as a person, but they're motivated to be like, let's, let's get going. Let's do some fun stuff. Let's do some serious stuff. Let's do some real work, right? Right. Yeah. Oh, no, the expectation is for real work, for beautiful work, for mm -hmm. complete work, <laughs> for really reaching, you know, where they need to go with that work and for them setting them off. I think you're ready to go on to this. Mm -hmm. So there's always a urge from either other students or from the teacher or whatever is to explore where do we go from here and that again happens in your freedom with responsibility and helping that child see where they need to go yeah well i hope i mean if anybody's listening and still thinks somehow you know montessori doesn't do real work or something i mean i know De debbie will laugh at it because it's like oh please but just pick up one of Montessori's books on anything with materials related to, ele related to elementary, and you'll learn really quickly that you probably can't do the work that the elementary children are doing. At least that's how I've found Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Know? You know, it's so intense. <laughs> Absolutely. I believe that in that elementary period of time, the children are capable of doing Ugh, all the amazing. work they would expect in a high school class. Yeah, you know, at a more different, difficult level. They've been exposed to it sensorially with the materials. They understand the concept. They can see what squaring and cubing is. Yes, yes. They've manipulated it. They yeah, it's not some formula. It's not some formula just copying. They, like you said, they can see the shape in their minds, which is incredible to me. Yeah. Right. So. And then they can explore 
civilizations because they're looking at what are human needs? Well, I need to eat and I need to mm -hmm. travel and I need to clothe myself. I wonder how they did that in 2000 BC. Yeah. <laughs> so they're looking at humans as being who we are today, serving the same needs that we have today. Yeah. Like these are kids. I said, you know, our brain capacity, the brain capacity of some early humans was this, was not too much different than what we have today. Yes. In some it's changed. And I said, look what they accomplished. <laughs> you know, yeah. that gift of language or that creation of fire was kind of a huge discovery. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think history is the integrating. I really think history and what has come before, where we are today and where we are guiding the child tomorrow is such an integrating whole factor of Montessori and her cosmic view of, mm -hmm. of the child and how the child fits into the universe and the world and responsibility to that. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, maybe that's a great place to be ending here because it's kind of full circle back to the beginning that you started with cosmic education, that it's, it's about the whole child. And it's about integrating all of existence, the whole world that we live in and past history. So, um, so yeah. Yeah. That's leaving a mark, not just on us today, but on who we are and our responsibility to the environment or, you know, you know, what, how we contribute because, you know, we are, what um, Mario used to say was suprahumans or Montessori, that we have the ability, we can change, we alter nature mm -hmm. by what we do. So it's, um, it's a big responsibility. And so you get children to love what they're doing and yes. they want to care for it. Yep, I agree. Well, great, Debbie. Is there anything you want to end with or is this, you think it's a good uh, integrating factor in the end or what do you say? I think that's just fine. Just let me know when you're going to take the elementary training, Jesse. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> we can I, talk further. <laughs> listen, maybe I'm going to have to call you up and we we set something up because my gosh, to, I would love you to hop in and do the elementary training. Then I'm in. I'm in. Oh, there's a lot of great trainers out there. A lot yeah. of of mine, and I just think it's, uh, you yeah, know, no, I've so. loved it every year and I still love it. And yeah. it's hard and as, of me. So. And I don't know if I'll, I don't think I said it yet, but you know, the reason I even found Debbie is because she was in one of my friends and colleagues classrooms and he, she just showed him something. He's like, Oh, I need some help with this. And you know, in a matter of like a minute and a half, Debbie gave him this, this brilliant advice. And he's like, Oh, you got to have this woman on your show. She is just so, <laughs> so, so, so thank you for all of the work you do, Debbie. And then thanks again for coming on. It's been a pleasure. So. Thanks, Jesse. I hope to keep in touch with you and see how things are going.